こんにちは。Welcome、uh, everyone to、uh, good afternoon and welcome to、uh, today's、uh, seminar, a s i s m o seminar.、Um, this is in fact today's seminar is the last in a series that we held、uh, over the year under the、uh, title of、uh, CJS 11. CJS is the、uh, acronym. Uh, for a conference of Jewish studies,、uh, which is a tradition that we've been holding at SISMOR for the past、uh, 15 years or so. We had、uh, 10、um, earlier uh, conferences, uh, the lectures of which you,、uh, were all printed and can also be read online at、uh, the SISMOR's、uh, website.、Uh, we always had a distinguished Uh, scholars from abroad, from、uh, Europe, America, Israel, and of course from Japan joining、um, in these conferences. But uh, unfortunately, um, as uh, in many other academic events,、uh, we could not hold it this time.、Uh, so we've been holding, uh, we've been holding it uh, over the past six months or so、um, gradually uh, online. Um, the subject uh, of this um, Uh, conference, so called conference, is a pilgrimage. And we've already had、um, lectures on、um, pilgrimage in、um, uh, medieval Christianity,、um, in various、uh, Muslim traditions,、uh, in con the contemporary、uh, types of、um, pilgrimage, including in Japan. Uh, and today we are traveling、uh, back in、uh, place and time、uh, to the ancient Near East.、Um, I believe I forgot to introduce myself,、um, although I believe everyone knows me. My name is、uh, Doron Cohen.、Um, I'm a research、uh, fellow at、uh, SISMOR and the part time teacher at DOSHA.、Um, today's um, Speaker、uh, is Professor Ada Tagar Cohen, who is also the、um, director of、uh, SISMO Center, has been the director in recent years, and、um, professor at、uh, Doshisha's、um, School of Theology and Graduate School. Her field of expertise is the Hebrew Bible and the ancient Near East.、Um, she has studied、uh, most of the、uh, languages. Of、um, antiquity in the middle,、uh, in the ancient Mideast, and but、um, particularly the Hittite language. And her main publication is a book about、um, Hittite priesthood,、um, beside of which she has published many, many scores of、uh, articles on various、uh, aspects of、um, biblical and、uh, Hittite and other、um, ancient Near Eastern subjects. Um, often in a comparative view. And、um, this is、uh, what we,、uh, she is going to speak about、uh, today as well、um, pilgrimage、uh, in the ancient Near East,、um, the Hittite、uh, tradition, and、uh, the Hebrew Bible.、Uh, she'll be speaking for about an hour. And、um, once she's done,、uh, we will open the floor for questions and answers. So, we're wishing you、uh, all an enjoyable seminar and、um, please, Professor Tagar Cohen, Ada, please begin. Thank you very much, Doron.、Uh, it's a pleasure. And I would like to、uh, thank all of you for taking your time. It's such a beautiful day outside、uh, of the spring. To、uh, sit with, with me for an hour and a half and listen about uh, uh, the Hittites and、uh, the Hebrew Bible. Let me share with you my、uh, PowerPoint and、uh, let, me, let me start.、Uh, the presentation today deals with two different cultural contexts. Being part of the larger culture of the ancient Near East, they were, however, set apart in time and place. The Hittite, 
my phone, hey, sorry. Here it is. The, the Hittite kingdom, no. Sorry, I need to check that it's working. Yes, okay. The Hittite kingdom, which existed between 1650 to 1180, belongs to the second millennium BCE and was located in Asia Minor, Turkey of today, while the ancient Israelite biblical culture existed approximately in the years 1000 to 580 of the first millennium BCE and was located in the Southern Levant land of Israel today. These cultures were not in direct contact, but still I believe in regard to the topic of today that uh, there is much interest in comparing them. The lecture will treat the evidence from these two cultures in a more general approach while introducing some relevant texts, although it will not be possible to discuss them in detail. I will try to answer questions concerning any details during the Q&A part at the end of the talk. I would like to say a word on cultural heritage before directly speaking on the Hittites and the Israelites, which will confirm my conviction why such comparison is viable. Cultural heritage is a matter of historical layers. It grows up, reaches a certain form, and then by historical interventions might be changed. The changes can be the result of te technological developments, natural disasters, and uh, confronting other cultures, especially other cults, uh, through peaceful exchange or via conquest and subjugation. An important point to remember re uh, regarding local cults is that when not totally extinguished, they can survive for hundreds of years, even when the official cult changes direction. We are aware of holy places which continue to be considered holy even after they are transformed from one religion to another, which shows how sacredness can stick to a place as the example of Jerusalem can show for several millennia. Many such uh, examples can be found throughout the world where a Christian church was constructed upon a pagan temple, a Muslim mosque replaced a church and so on. In the Holy Land, some sites are uh, venerated simultaneously by the followers of different religions. And in peaceful times, pilgrims visit them uh, indiscriminately. In both cultures we are discussing uh, today, the changed identity of holy pilgrimage sites are very common. The basic concept of pilgrimage is the visit to a sacred place through a journey. The aim of the journey uh, in the Hebrew Bible, and as we will see also in the Hittite world, was to worship a divine entity in its dwelling place, or the place where that deity had appeared. Visiting the sacred place is in order to bring presence to the deity, or in plural deities, and make sacrifices. The presence and sacrifices are expected by the deities. The act is essentially a personal one, even when organized by a higher institution. Still, two types of pilgrimage uh, activity can be discerned in the ancient world. A pilgrimage by the individual, which presents a personal homage to the divine world, or a state pilgrimage that is conducted by the rulers in order to consolidate their power. 
evidence for both types of pilgrimage can be found in both Hebrew Bible and Hittite texts. The Hebrew Bible has instructions to the Israelites as a nation and as individuals regarding the visits to their God in the following passages. <clears throat> From Exodus 34, uh, we have three times in the year, all your uh, males shall appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. And also, uh, for I will cast out nations before you and uh, enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. And then three times a year, all your males shall appear before uh, the Lord uh, your God at the place that he will choose, at the festival of the unleavened bread, at the festival of weeks, and at the festival of booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. All shall give as they are able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. These texts present the main aim and reasoning for the pilgrimage. Worshippers had to be seen before the deity and bring them, uh, bring him, in, the, in this case, presence from their own produce. They were commanded to do this three times a year during three calendric agricultural festivals, the festival of unleavened bread in spring, the festival of weeks in early summer, and the festival of booths in the autumn. Uh, <clears throat> they <clears throat> only the males are uh, specified, and they had to come from around the country leaving their families behind without fearing that their houses would be attacked while they were gone. And in similar way, Hittite texts in, uh, in, instructed the regional commanders regarding the temples to the gods, which had to be uh, cared for. And this is CTH 261. And doesn't work, he died 60, uh, 261, and I read the first part. Uh, furthermore, reverence for the gods must be maintained and special reverence for the storm god is to be established. If some temple roof leaks, the margrave and the city commander must repair it. Or if some writing of the storm god or any cultic implement of another god is ruined, the Sangha priests, the Guru priests, and the Shiwantsana or Shiwantsani priestesses will renew it. And whatever springs are in the city, sacrifices are established for those springs. Let them celebrate them and attend to them. They must definitely attend also to those springs for which there is no sacrifice. Let them not omit them. They must consistently sacrifice the mountains and rivers for which there are uh, rites. And the establishment of the cultic activity had to be under the local administration as of old. Now attend to it again let them restore it as it was built before, let them rebuild it in the same way. The locals would celebrate their gods, especially uh, those of nature. Before discussing the concept of the festivals and the worship as part of the pilgrimage in the two cultures, I would like to provide a short description at the landscape of both regions since the landscape also correlates with the creation of sacred places. The core of the older Hittite kingdom was located 
in the central center central part I, I don't know what's going on here sorry here central part <clears throat> of anatolia and um, it was identified by the Hittites as the land of the storm god of Hatti and the central city, its capital, not far from or between Ankara and Chorum, eh, was Hatusha, nowadays Berzkoi. The land is widespread and at its center eh, is a wide high plateau surrounded by ranges of high mountains, which in many cultures were considered the dwelling of the gods. The country thrives mainly on agriculture and animal has, uh, husbandry and depended on the rainy season for water and therefore the rain bringing uh, a storm god was always the major deity. The region's rivers and springs were also part of the complex uh, of the world of the divine entities, which constituted the Hittite religion. We have springs. I'm sorry, something is wrong. Here, we have springs, mountains, and special rock formations were also considered divine uh, manifestation place for a deity to which homage was paid by visits. They would visit these uh, springs as we re a a saw in my previous text. The interwining of natural phenomena and divine powers is attested by the Hittite political treaties, which were concluded with the calling upon a long list of deities to be the witnesses to these treaties. At the end of the list, we find natural phenomena, the mountains, the rivers, the springs, the great sea, heaven and earth, the winds and the clouds, they shall be witnesses to these treaty and oath. International trade was carried along the east to west roads, which were also routes for cultural exchange. The land of Israel also depended on the rainy season of winter. And during the hot summers, when rain was scarce, wells and springs dried up and the population could suffer. The land consists of a hilly region with flat valleys and the long seashore of the Mediterranean Sea livelihood depended on agriculture. This land was also a crossland uh, for international roads, mainly going from south to north in this case. Uh, the Canaanite deities, the precursors of the God of Israel were also weather gods such as the storm god Baal, uh, that you can see uh, his uh, statues in Stella. The Canaanite deities, um, uh, sorry, uh, some, some of those deities were connected with specific sites and were named after them, such as Beit El, the house of El, which we find in the story of Jacob and in later traditions. Although in their religious reforms, some of the kings of Judea tried to obliterate previous cults and promote only one God, Yahweh, many traditions, in particular those connected with specific holy sites in the Northern Kingdom, persisted for a long time. Worship of the gods. Both regions are on crossroads and thus were influenced by other cultures. Much of the worship to the deities under the royal houses of both cultures was composed of the state festivals connected with the seasons. In regard to Hatti, 
the festivals connected with the specific places, which can be considered local cults, were a, con a continuation of previous cults that existed before the Hittite royal house was established around 1650 BCE. The indigenous people were named based on their language, Hattians, and seemingly they gave the land of Hatti its name. The people we call Hittites today spoke the Neshili language and therefore should have been named Neshites by scholars. But since they were identified in the 19th century with the biblical Hittites in correlation with the region of Hatti, that became their name in scholarly history. As a, <clears throat> sorry, a, as migrating population arriving in Anatolia at the beginning of the second millennium BCE, the Hittites adopted the cultic worship of the Hattians and added their own cultic beliefs to practice, to the practice. Later, they were also influenced on the royal level at least by the Hurrian religious cultic practices. The Israelites were also, according to the biblical texts, a migrating population who made the land then called Canaan their own. They too adopted previously existing, existing sacred places and cults. And in some cases, the deities such as Baal and Asherah, as well as probably some other local deities. Not only Canaanite deities were identified with specific locations, but Yahweh himself was identified with specific sites such as from Kuntilat Ajrud, Yahweh of Samaria and Yahweh of Teiman. Similarly, the Hittites had as well uh, as the storm god of Hatti, whose main dwelling was the great temple of Hattusha, there were the storm god of the city Tsipalanda, the storm god of the city of Nerik, and the city of Churma, and Khalpa, and Kashtama, and many other storm gods to which local festivals were celebrated. The Hittite texts prescribed the obligation to worship the deities at their local shrines. The texts indicate clearly which deity in which city or at which mountain should be worshiped. And the calendric period is in many cases also indicated. Most often spring or beginning of autumn. Spring is the time before the king goes out to battle and autumn is after returning, returning to rest during the winter. The Hittite calendar of festivals was condensed with many more festivals than the ones suggested in the biblical verses that I quoted above, which only prescribed three annual festivals. According to collected lists of festival names and names of deities celebrated in different locations around the country, there were more than 160 festivals in the Hittite calendar. The question whether all those festivals are for the entire population should be answered negatively. The festivals can first be divided into festivals celebrated by the royals and those celebrated in local shrines without the participation of a member from the royal family. Thus, we have what is termed in Hittatology, local cults versus state cults. The state cults are the festivals celebrated with the participation of a certain member of the royal family or by the larger family, including king and queen, their children and in-laws, while the population is not mentioned. However, in the local cultic texts, the instructions are giving, given to the priests on how to include and treat the population during the festivals. In the Hebrew Bible, 
we are less aware of such a division, although we might see some similarities where we encounter attempts to describe what we call historical accounts, which I will discuss further on. The festivals seem to be presented in both cultures in the form of a list. In the biblical texts, we encounter Leviticus chapter 23 and Deuteronomy chapter 16, which list the three major festivals to Yahweh. The list in the Hittite text uh, instructing the temple personnel looks similar in its intent, but is to the priests only. The following commandments come from a text titled Instruction to Temple Personnel, and it goes like this. Furthermore, the festival of the month, the festival of the year, the festival of the stag, the festival, uh, the fall festival, the festival of spring, the, fest the thunder festival, the festival of Chiyara, the festival of Pudacha, the festival of Chishua, the festival of Shatlasha, and the festival of the Riten, the festivals of the sacred Sangha priest, the festivals of the old men, the festivals of the Amadingir priestesses, the festival of uh, Dachia, and I can uh, continue. And basically, they are expected to uh, um, um, uh, celebrate it and uh, do it uh, without uh, any uh, uh, offering uh, uh, being short. And the festivals indicated here are already numerous compared with the Bible. And it is important also to note that they seem not to relate to the seasonal festivals only, but also social class festivals which could be interpreted as festivals ordered for the cult professionals in relation to their gods. So uh, let me go on and terminology of festivals. In the Hebrew Bible, reference is made to all festivals using the following terms, moed, which means appointed time, mikra kodesh, which means holy convocation, the word Chag, festival or celebration. We also find the term, for example, Chag Yahweh, uh, which means the festival of Yahweh. The seasons are also indicated by terms such as uh, Asif, Katsir, Aviv, which is spring harvest gathering for the major festivals, as well as the Rosh Chodesh, which is the head of the month. In Hita texts, the major term for festival is written in the Sumerogram as an four and read in Akkadian as Isinu, which in the Hita text is correlated with the Hittite noun Kaleshtarwana. The noun Kaleshtarwana is probably derived from the Hittite verb Kalesh, meaning to call, to summon, or to evoke the deity or the people to, to the festival. Here, it presents us with the main function of a festival, to call the gods to the feast and a celebration, as is the combination in the Hebrew Bible, Mikra Kodesh, standing for same concept of a holy encounter. And in Leviticus, for example, we will see the following, uh, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, these are the appointed festivals of Yahweh, and this is Moadei Yahweh, that you shall proclaim as holy convocations, and this is Mikra Kodesh. These are my appointed festivals. These are Moadai. And the term Moadei Adonai, literally Yahweh meeting times, are correlated with holy convocations, which can also be termed as holy assembly, in which the gods, or the god in this case, uh, is invoked and invited to the feast. The major Hittite festivals, sorry, um, 
uh, included prescriptions for great assembly, which is Shali Ashesha, and translated literally as great or grand or important place. And we have in the Hebrew Bible, Ohel Moed, or even Hamakom, the place. It refers to the very special meals conducted on the festival day. For example, uh, the largest Hittite uh, festival of the spring, the Antachshum festival, indicates as follows. The next day, the king and queen enter Tachupa. The king deri uh, drives up to Tachupa in a chariot. In the Chalentu house, the great assembly takes place. In the Bible, we find the entrance to the temple to the tent of meeting as the place for worship. And goes like uh, this, uh, at the entrance of the tent of meeting. There is emphasis regarding the idea of the timing of the festivals to be celebrated. The biblical text indicates this uh, as such. Sorry. Uh, Okay, something is wrong. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, this is the text. Um, command the Israelites and say to them, my offering, the food for my offerings by fire, my pl uh, pleasing order, you shall take care to offer to me at its appointed time. And the appointed times are according to all the statutes and all the regulations that you must keep. And God is giving those. And similarly, the Hittite uh, command to the temple personnel also says, okay, you, who are temple person, temple men, if you do not celebrate the festivals on the time of each festival and the spring festival you celebrate in the fall or the fall festival you celebrate in the spring, if the right time to perform a festival has come and the one who is to perform it comes to you, the Sangha priests, the Guru priests and the Amadingri priestesses and to the temple men, he seizes their their knees and say, the harvest is before me, or marriage, or a journey, or some other matter, please support me. Uh, do not act according to the man's will. So do not do, just keep doing it on time. This passage shows also the connection between the priesthood and the population regarding their responsibility to celebrate the festivals on time. In a very early command of Khatushili the first, uh, he says to his heir to the throne as follows. Uh, in a, um, be very careful about the matter of the gods, their sacrificial loaves, their libations, their stew, and their go uh, groats must be kept ready for them. You, Moshili, must not postpone them, nor fall behind. If you were to postpone them, it would be evil, eh, as indeed was the former condition. So be it. And indeed, um, eh, King Tudhalia, um, the fourth, several hundred years later, uh, prays to the sun goddess of Arena with the following words. I shall confess my sin before you, and never again shall I omit the festivals. I will not interchange the spring and autumn festivals. The festivals of spring I shall perform only in the spring, and the festival of the autumn I shall perform only in the autumn. And uh, place and time go hand in hand to create a, a cosmos in which humans and gods exist together. The biblical and the Hittite texts explain clearly this mutuality 
of the relations between the people and the divine world. Let's go back to the idea of the visit to the gods, which stands at the core of the concept of pilgrimage as indicated in the biblical texts quoted above. The two cultures show that the main idea of the relations with the divine world is to worship the deity at its holy dwelling. And thus, there is a need to create for the deity the house and then maintain it. Temples were the result of activity conducted either by local communities, but mostly by ruling authorities. Um, houses for the gods are written in cuneiform sumerograms as etu dingia, which can be read, read in Hittite shiunash parna, and correlating with the Hebrew expression for temple, Beit Yahweh or Beit El, that is the house of Yahweh or the house of El or just the house of a God. This house was the place where the deity met with the worshippers. And for this reason, the worshippers were supposed to come and visit and pay homage. Uh, attempting to look at both cultures through a historical lens, we can see the royal house's activities regarding the construction of temples or establishing or re-establishing cultic uh, activities. When I use the term historical texts for the Bible, I mostly refer to texts from the books of Samuel, Kings and Chronicles. There are several texts which relate stories regarding pilgrimage and I will mention five of them. The first one falls under the designation individual pilgrimage, while the others can be regarded as state or royal pilgrimages. And the first one, the family pilgrimage, which Samuel's father's house conducted every year to the temple of Eli, the priest of, uh, of Shiloh, in 1 Samuel 1st 1, and it says, now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. The pilgrimage was conducted once a year and not three times as in the commandments of the Torah. Furthermore, the entire family went to the temple, not the males alone. The second one, uh, the festival King David celebrated when bringing the Ark of Yahweh to Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 6. A festival was organized and participated uh, in by the king on the occasion of bringing the holy presence of his personal God to his capital. But many people participated as well. Uh, this was accompanied by sacrifice a, of a large number of animals. The third one, the pilgrimage of King Solomon made to worship at the temple of Gibeon in 1 Kings 3, uh, verses 4 to 15. The story is crucial <clears throat> for the comparison with the Hittite cult practice, and I will consider it in, uh, in the following uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, the fourth, the construction of temples by Jeroboam I in Beit El and in Dan, when he uh, expected the population of his kingdom to worship instead of making a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which became the capital of the enemy kingdom. And that is in 1 Kings 12, 26 to 33. The fifth one, is the great Passover festival celebrated by King Hezekiah in Jerusalem. And we assume it was sometime in 705 or something like this, to which Israelites from the north and south came in, uh, in Second Chronicles 29 and 30. This, uh, these two chapters tell 
the story of the renewal of worship in the temple in Jerusalem, to which all the Israelites, including those from the destroyed Northern Kingdom, were invited to attend for uh, the festival of the spring. What can be seen in the list of examples from the biblical text is that most of them relate to royal activities, which are easier to be compared with the Hittite material, since the Hittite texts mainly give a picture of cultic activity from the royal perspective. However, let me start with the first example from the book of Samuel, which is not of a royal one, but rather reflects the pilgrimage of a household, probably a prosperous one, to the main temple of the region, eh, maybe a distance of a day travel for them. The entire family went to the temple and sacrificed and sit there to eat and celebrate while also being able to pray for their well-being. An interesting similarity to an episode mentioned in this story can be found in the Hittite texts. In the instruction to the temple personnel, a warning is given regarding disturbances during the festival when the people visit the temple as follows. And this is CTH 264. And furthermore, you who are Sangha priests, Guru priests, Amma Dinger priestesses, the temple men, if there is a Tuchmeyant men, which I don't know exactly what it is, inside the temple or in another sacred building, someone gets drunk. If he is disturbing inside the temple and he causes a quarrel and breaks up a festival, let them beat him. Further, let him celebrate that festival as set up ready with oxen, sheep, uh, bread and beer. Be very careful with a quarrel. Looking back at the biblical text in the first chapter of Samuel, we find the priest Eli checking whether Hana was drunk. Here is uh, their conversation in uh, Samuel 1st, uh, verses 12 to 17. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hana was praying silently, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, how long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hana answered, no, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have, a drunk, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. Let's take another look at the Hittite local cults. As can be seen in the descriptions and instructions set up for local cults, the main procedure took place during the two seasonal festivals, autumn and spring. In the first, a large sealed vessel filled with grain was set up ahead for the deity or deities uh, of the city. When spring came, this vessel was opened and the grain was milled and bread was made with the flour. The temple personnel who were responsible for its care and prepar preparing the sacrifices also took the statue of the God from its pedestal in the shrine and moved it to its stella outside of the city. They washed and anointed the statue and the stella and offer it food and beverages. 
They also ate and drank themselves. In the evening, they would return the statue to its shrine. The next day, they joined the locals in the festival by having a sports contest or a game of war. The following example shows that the king himself took care of establishing the shrine and that the amounts of sacrifices to be offered were, were also fixed in advance actually by him. All these festivals are indicated as celebrated mainly to the local storm god. And uh, for example, Cabo 2-7, uh, this is a specific uh, town uh, uh, which is uh, Wianuanta and the storm god of Husha, sun goddess, stag god, and the god Pirwa, his majesty established, established the construction of a statutes and of a shrine. His majesty uh, instituted, uh, and here comes the amounts of uh, wheat and um, uh, how many uh, pitos, and uh, to which God, how much goes. And then in the autumn festival, when in the festival, uh, they pour one Parisu measure of wheat, and um, then this amount of flour and beer uh, and so on for that specific gods. Uh, and in this case, this is the God, his festival is set up or, Spring festival, when spring comes and it thunders, they open the pithas. They break three loaves of sweet bread. They fill the specific vessels. They grind and mile the wheat and they offer uh, goat to the god, to this storm god. Uh, moving to the concept of royal pilgrimage, the biblical examples show how the royal houses of Israel and Judah use the location of the temple to uh, their political advantage. I will start with King David's move of a, a sacred artifact to his worshiping place in the city, which he had recently conquered and made his capital. David was, was thus creating a holy location which was attached to his palace. It was identified as a tent, but was erected on a previously sacred place, which he had acquired from the previous ruler, King Aravna. He acquired that goren with a threshing floor, which must have been a place for a, a sacrifices, thus holy place previously. Here too, we can see the phenomenon in which a sacred place remains sacred even with the changes of the ruler's religion. The festival for bringing the Ark of Yahweh to Jerusalem was certainly a special one for the king. It is a royal festival, but its date was not given. David created a holy place in his capital for his personal God. The great temple would be built by his son. And here comes the next story about Solomon in Gibeon. Uh, in 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, verse 4, it, it indicated uh, clearly the reason for the king's journey to Gibeon. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. There is not yet a great temple uh, for a Yahweh in Jerusalem. There is only the tent that was established by David with the ark. Jerusalem, um, okay, uh, the king, the, uh, king Solomon um, went to Gibeon to have actually an incubation dream. He stays overnight in the temple to encounter the deity who appears to him in a, in a very special dream. 
it was not during a special festival, but rather during a visitation, maybe part of his inauguration ceremonies, a pilgrimage the king made to the great temple for himself. We find the Hittite kings doing similar acts. The Hittite king and queen, as well as crown prince or princes, would travel the country to visit important deities and pay them homage. The journey could be during the specific times of festivals, but it could also be for special acts of worship by the royals with no connection to a season seasonal uh, festival. During the festivals, the king and queen travel to cultic centers at a distance of one to three days from the capital. For example, the Hittite king Tutkhalia II introduced a specific cult to a temple in a city called Shamucha, and uh, his descendant, Moshili II, uh, reinforced it. And it says as follows, uh, as he declares the cult instructions, he says as follows, in the future, whenever the king or the queen or the prince or princess will come to visit the temple of the goddess of the night of Shamucha, they shall perform these rituals. In the following, uh, the text speci uh, specifies cultic activities uh, and instructs uh, how the royals should worship the deity at Shamucha. A parallel activity to the visit of Solomon to Gibbon can be found in a ritual titled as festival prescribed for a Hittite prince, actually the heir to the throne, as he is to make a pilgrimage to visit the goddess Katacha of the city Ankua. And this is CTH 633. This goddess is an ancient Hattian goddess identified as a queen from her name, and Ankua is an ancient cultic center prior to the Hittite kingdom's uh, rule over the region. The prince leaves Hattusha on a three-day journey to Ankua with his entourage. When he arrives, he conducts specific rituals to the goddess on the compound of the temple and mentioned in the, in the last act of the text, we have uh, in uh, the text we have in hand, uh, an incubation scene where he's sleeping in the temple. And to my understanding, he is communicating with the goddess in the same way that um, Solomon commu communicated with Yahweh. But unfortunately, we don't have the end of the festival, but that's the last scene. And it looks like that. Uh, he goes into the Arzana house. Over there, too, he requests to eat three warm breads, ten labaco breads, ten barley breads, ten sweet breads of three ukno measure of barley, one wakshul vessel of milk, two chupar vessels of beer. Twelve karkid women sit down in front of him and they eat and drink. At that night, the prince they purify in that same way when they make him lie down to sleep at either side of his head, they place two thick breads. At either side of his feet, two thick breads they place. After that, with beer around, they mark them, which means probably the breads. And uh, as, however, he is, and here we are missing the verb, maybe shaking, the carkid women make him, wake him up. So uh, uh, within the context of his dream, they wake him up. So I think that's a in very clear incubation uh, uh, situation. However, spectacular pilgrimages were conducted by the king and queen according to the prescriptive festival texts during the spring and autumn festivals. Both festivals 
included cultic activities uh, conducted uh, over a full month. In the spring, the Antachshum festival was celebrated with the king being instructed on how to leave the capital and travel to the nearby city of Tachurpa and together with the Greek queen return to Hatusha to conduct the specific festival rituals. Several days later, the king traveled to the city of Arina, where he worships the great sun goddess of earth. In the following days, the king and queen are back in Hatusha celebrating different gods in their temples in the capital. The main gods to be celebrated were the storm god of Tsipalanda and the sun goddess of Arina. The storm god of Hati was celebrated only on the 12th day. However, this festival was regarded as a very important one as it opened the new year and brought about the blessings of the gods. The old year's sign, probably, was deposited in the Cheshta temple of the underworld deity, probably Lelwani. The vessel of grain stored in the autumn was opened and bread for the gods was prepared from it. This is symbolic in regard to continuation and traveling from the capital to the other town symbolizes the continued rule over the land by the royal family supported by the divine world. Traveling around the country may have become at a certain time a burden to an aging king and thus a prince or a princess was sent from the royal family to perform the rites and festivals. Some of the Hittite festivals would find their main performance acted in the capital. One of the most elaborate festivals that became known to Hittitologists from the early deciphered texts is the what is written Kilam Festival. Its name is translated as the Gatehouse Festival. The festival is known from oldest Hittite manuscripts. It is a central three-day festival performed once a year exclusively to the gods in the capital, in which the deities worshipped were mainly the Khatian gods. In this festival, the king and queen inspect a procession of gods to the temple of the goddess of grain, and then a line of administrators from different regions or cities um, of the kingdom come to Hatusha and stand at the gate of their house. So it's a kind of a, 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 a maybe tent or something like that that is a, a set up and they have offerings of bread, livestock and beverages that the king and the queen inspect. It is a symbolic pilgrimage from the towns in the vicinity of the capital, paying homage to the gods of the capital. Looking at the formation of the city of Hatusha, the southern part of the city receives a special structure, uh, reveals, sorry, a special structure that has been interpreted by archeologists as a religious construction. And it looks like that. This is the um, um, probably formation of the uh, map, kind of map of Hatusha. And the, as you can see, the southern part has this kind of two very large uh, um, uh, gates. Uh, one is the King's Gate and the other one is the Lion Gates because of the statues that we can see at the entrance. And there is a very interesting place called Yerkapi with another um, gate over here. And maybe uh, we can see it uh, located here. You can see this is the ramp, a beautiful ramp and the, 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 the gates are one here and one we cannot see in the picture. And here is the other gate. 
and maybe the processions were walking over here and they would come over here, maybe perform something. Maybe the Kilan Festival was conducted over here. I have no idea uh, uh, where uh, it was, although the, the description says that it is in the compound of the palace. So uh, that's a little bit difficult uh, to uh, really uh, uh, locate specifically. Maybe it was in the compound of the of the palace, which we have the royal palace was on the mountain over there uh, on the top. Uh, and uh, sorry, over here, here it is. And uh, it's it's very difficult to uh, really uh, locate specifically, I think, uh, where the, the king uh, was at a very every specific point of the festivals. During the festivals, the Hittite king and queen would travel, as I said, and I think these festivals had a political, very strong political impact. While the members of the royal family were traveling through the country, they were showing their power of rule over the land. And once they were passing, I'm sure people were looking at them or waiting for them and blessing them and so on. To return to the Israelite kings mentioned above, Jeroboam I identified politically the borders of his kingdom by establishing or renewing royal temples in the north city of Dan and the southern city of his kingdom, uh, Beit El. And I think we could see I'm sorry, it's this one. There it is. And uh, you can see the map of Israel and the kingdoms. This was the northern point of Israel a, a kingdom, the Israelite kingdom. And Beth El is over here. By the way, this is Shiloh of Samuel. And uh, then we have Jerusalem over here. And we have Be'er Sheva here. And Beth El we're told that Jeroboam came from his capital, Shechem, over here, a very old, ancient uh, 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 city, to sacrifice to Yahweh at Bet El. So the borders of his country, the borders of the country at the time of David and Solomon are identified by Dan in the north and Beersheba in the south. An interesting change regarding Rehoboam, Solomon, Solomon heir to the throne, tells that he came to the religious city of Shechem to be royally inaugurated by the northern tribes. Rehoboam went to, the, to Shechem for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. And it is well attested in other biblical texts that this city was regarded sacred including the two mountains surrounding it, Mount Gerizim and Mount Eval. Jeroboam I indeed settled uh, in it in Shechem uh, at his inauguration when uh, dividing Israel from Judah. Later on, he moved to other cities. As for the story of Hezekiah, king of Judah, he is said to have sent messengers to the entire land, which was considered great Israel, as it was in the time of Solomon, before the kingdom was divided into Israel in, in the north and Judah in the south. And it was in the time that it was conquered by the Assyrians uh, that he was sending the messengers. His call for the population to make a pilgrimage for a great festival of over a week in Jerusalem for the god Yahweh was a political act in attempt to solidify the north with the south under the identity of the one god Yahweh. In 2 Chronicles 35, so they decreed to make a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba to Dan 
that the people should come and keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel at Jerusalem, for they had not kept it in great numbers as prescribed. And then in the next verses, it says from the time of Solomon. And let me conclude. Pilgrimage in the ancient world is part of the cosmic order set by the gods and in Israel specifically but set by Yahweh. However, pilgrimage must also be placed in a social and political context. The idea of visitation to a holy place, a place considered traditionally sacred, was a basic activity in many societies in the ancient world. Local communities have worshipped their local deities for centuries by supporting the local temples. In a cult designated by the authorities, the rulers were the initiators and the carriers of the worship to the gods. The Hittite kingdom had a state organization of the priesthood and the royal house controlled and maintained the cult centers around the country. They instituted a specific priesthood in different key regions and provided for different temples in order to maintain the cult activities, uh, specifically during festival times. The royal houses in ancient Israel and Judah did the same as is indicated by the activities of David, who sent the Levites around the kingdom, and Solomon, who followed him. Further, we learn of Jeroboam I establishing a northern system. Maybe he's actually replacing David's and Solomon's system by the previous system that used to exist. In order to maintain their divine support, and demonstrate it publicly, the kings traveled between the temples and sacred places that existed traditionally in the region and founded and strengthened existing temples. They then traveled personally with the, um, within their borders to show their control of the region, paying homage to the gods that supported them. And I would like to close with the very well-known psalm on the idea of the greatness of the uh, walls of the holy city. The earth is Yahweh's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, who shall ascend the mountain of Yahweh, those who have clean hands and pure hearts. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. There is the procession. Who is this King of glory? The Lord Yahweh of hosts. He is the King of glory, Selah. Thank you very much. <laughs>